So I'm going to be talking from a GIS, ge geographical kind of direction, a viewpoint. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and yeah, apply that to um, biology and, and also the social aspects of, of biology. Uh, so more, more relevant to the, uh, the uh, activities uh, that, that are so prevalent in the centre. Um, and touching upon management as well. Um, in particular, um, yeah, we, we, we see nowadays lots of um, yeah, map representations. Maps have power in presenting you know, rather a lot of data in a nice, accessible form. Um, but you know, they have this scientific basis. Um, that's not a problem in itself, but uh, that kind of viewpoint uh, on the yeah, approach to the map and making it and, and, uh, you know, the data that goes into the map um, perhaps uh, doesn't show you the whole story. So pretty much what I'm going to be doing today is uh, offering some different viewpoints. These are kind of viewpoints that would uh, actually complement the scientific map uh, from the point of view of uh, art and also um, the narrative, the story behind the map too. And in particular, I'll be concentrating on two case studies uh, that I worked on in, in New Zealand. One to do with uh, informal mapping of the bluff oyster fishery. And so that uh, integrates that uh, social aspect as well as uh, yeah, the oysters being very much uh, something under biological study. And uh, using art uh, to depict the history of the Kia. So this is a collaboration with uh, a local artist. Uh, so I'll be uh, reporting on those uh, projects. Um, so firstly, uh, where I come from, uh, I guess those, those humans in rugby, uh, the Highlanders uh, from time to time come and visit Brisbane and play the Reds, I guess. Um, uh, this is actually a slide from uh, our marketing manager in surveying. Uh, how he depicts uh, the School of Spain to um, visitors to Dunedin, which is where, where, where I work in, in school. Um, and so, yeah, rugby is uh, very prevalent. Uh, this, is the, this is the reality. This is the actual School of Spain itself. It's the best picture I could uh, come up with <laughs> in the web. But uh, it's, uh, it's much bigger than this. Yeah. Um, an old maternity hospital, indeed. Yeah. So, it's, it's here that I... Uh, Basically, uh, teach and research in, in GIS, and uh, that's, that's where uh, Emily and the Nathan uh, they, they come from this building too. Literally, or <laughs> 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 So the map. So. Uh, we, we are, we're increasingly bombarded with uh, lots and lots of maps um, in, you know, through newspapers, uh, through uh, journal articles and so on. And their power is long, long kind of uh, yeah, respected and, and used. Um, over the last few hundred years, uh, the making of maps has been overly scientific. So there's a, there's a kind of quest for uh, accuracy and uh, Quest to make the representation of the map as objective as possible, um, true to its purpose. And uh, it's a great uh, integrator of a vast amount of information. Uh, you know, if you try to put that kind of information into something like you know, text or, or speaking about it, then it'll be inadequate compared with how the map is. So the map then, as a supreme 
geospatial communicator. Uh, you know, what more natural way is it to present uh, data located in space than the map? But we're going to move on from the scientific map and try and look at other ways of representing uh, geography. In particular, um, moving away from data that's kind of measured through GPS or through other instruments, um, data that's uh, uh, you know, um, that comes from uh, sensors in space, you know, raster data, remote sense data, um, that captures you know a valuable part of uh, our existence, or you know, a valuable part of what the Earth has. But there's also uh, other kind of worlds. Uh, these are kind of, you know, worlds that are oriented towards towards us as humans, our everyday living. So um, increasingly, these these worlds are, are being captured, and uh, you know the the ability of you know, human beings nowadays to you know, have smartphones and and the smartphones actually collect your tracks in space. It means that increasingly individual geographies are, are becoming quite prevalent and uh, indeed a natural uh, canvas uh, for, for maps. But these individual paths can quite easily be linked with uh, other representations of your day-to-day existence like you know, a blog or tweets or um, whatever you post on Facebook. And so uh, these uh, blogs, tweets and Facebook uh, Posts are basically your own story throughout the day, and it's a, it's a kind of personal story, and it's uh, it conveys a kind of emotional aspect of geography, which um, should be in there somewhere. It's, it's kind of something that's been denied in the scientific maps. So how do you put those uh, emotional, you know, human-oriented uh, content <coughs> into um, spatial representation? So two two ways I'm going to explore are these personal narratives and art, uh, and em emphasise that these become a, a complement to the scientific map. Here's an illustration. Uh, so at the moment, Dean uh, is pretty uh, much colder than it is here. Um, so the snowfalls uh, abound, and there's two kind of world views. On that, there's that scientific worldview where you know you might get a depiction like this: the uh, the roads closed due to snow. It's a straightforward mapping of roads. And then again, there's also uh, things like this. This is a, it's a geolocated tweet on uh, Twitter Earth, and uh, this is uh, someone's kind of uh, take, personal take on on snow and uh, and the weather. And you know, here we've got an explicit uh, you know meshing of of that kind of scientific map. Is Google Earth, and uh, this uh, this personalised thing. This is this is well worth a visit actually. It's, you know, you put in a, a search like Snow NZ, and it searches for tweets, uh, wherever they are in the world, and it just the world just rotates. So it's, it's like a like some kind of uh, Twitter channel in a way. So yeah, how can you combine the personal and the scientific? This is one way. Um, we're going to look uh, initially at one case study. Um, so I, I was the GIS analyst on, on this uh, project oriented around the Bluff oyster fishery. And in Bluff, uh, as you, you know, go and visit Bluff, there's like two views on the oyster fishery uh, kind of presented. There's one that's represented by the, the managers of the oyster fishery, which um, depicts, in, in, a, in a public face at least, uh, that the oyster fishery is quite healthy and uh, will go on, you know, ad infinitum. Um, but there's you know, a group of concerned locals, uh, predominantly retired fishermen, who see that, um, in particular, there's overfishing and dredging that's affecting the, the long-term uh, viability of the, of the industry, perhaps even short-term. So they don't, they don't see the fishery carrying on for long. You know, for that long at all, if fishing is to carry on at the same levels. There's also this disease, Bonamia as well, which is uh, blighting uh, the oysters. 
In terms of um, public representation, it's the uh, the managers and augmented by scientists uh, uh, that actually have, I guess, the public stage. So there's one one view of this being depicted, and uh, I guess this project concerns about how to kind of give, I guess, a stage to the other point of view, the re retired uh, fishers who. Um, you know, you know who, who, who up to now, don't, you know, they don't have much of a, uh, a kind of uh, a stage for which to present their point of view. And so, tying in with uh, public participation GIS, community-led GIS, um, this project set out to record the, uh, I guess, the geography, the knowledge, the local knowledge of these fishers, and. Uh, Try and present it by GIS to a, to a wider, wider stage. The aim was to have that scientific knowledge, the, the knowledge that uh, is presented uh, via the managers, and its local knowledge side by side. So, you know, it's two representations of the fishery one informal mapping, one kind of formal mapping. Okay. And uh, the way in which this happened was. Uh, a low-tech um, data collection, quite simply A0 charts of uh, where the bluff oyster fishing industry is located. That's the Fobo Strait in between uh, the south of the South Island, um, bluff uh, being the most, yeah, you know, southernmost town, and uh, Stewart Island, which is uh, some 20k offshore. And uh, and so basically, you know. Uh, the structured interviews with these uh, uh, fishermen, and <coughs> decade by decade, they're invited to actually draw where they used to fish. Okay. And this way, there's uh, this kind of local knowledge stretching back to the 1940s up to um, the last decade. So, in doing this, so that's the first stage, and then it's scanned into a GIS. So digitized. Um, basically, through technology, I guess, and dissemination of information, it kind of lends the you know, this previously kind of disempowered group uh, some kind of power through dissemination of information. That was the aim. So just as an illustration, this is uh, this is an unrelated map, but uh, illustrates two, two, two viewpoints. A kind of form mapping, um, if you excuse the proportional symbol and the, the misuse of uh, aerial uh, areas. Um, basically, these uh, kind of zones used to represent the uh, aggregated yield of oysters. So that kind of that represents a scientific point of view. And this is more the, um, the local knowledge. Their knowledge is more kind of place-based. So they, they, they kind of uh, think of the fishery in terms of you know, basic um, fishing grounds that they used to go to day by day and fish, fish them until they, they either retired or the grounds became extinct. Here's a representation of extinct <coughs> grounds here. So you know they, they kind of regard these fishing grounds pretty much as we perhaps regard places on land. Very different uh, view of the fishery than, than the scientific view. And this is the kind of uh, information that we're trying to uh, kind of collect. Uh, you know, information that otherwise be lost, basically. Okay. So alongside this mapping, there was also. Um, videotaped interviews as well, and also local meetings, uh, which kind of went uh, to support another part of the project. Uh, for the mappings themselves, as I said, um, their old oyster fishing uh, grounds were, were, were kind of drawn on, alongside other information like uh, you know, what boats they fished on, and, uh, and so on. Here's an example of one fisher's uh, knowledge. This one uh, fished uh, the Fogo Strait um, in the late 50s and uh, early 1960s. And uh, you can see here 
the street itself, uh, the south end of the South Island, Bluff is here, Bluff Harbour, and Stewart Island. As you can see, um, we've got the red areas are what this uh, fisherman, uh, Bill Pascoe, fished uh, in the late 50s, and the green is uh, the 60s. And these are all digitized for each fisherman. So some uh, 16 or 17 fishermen were, um, I guess, interrogated, uh, strong word, interviewed in this way. And uh, these were then all put into a GIS, Arc GIS, and this is the I guess, aggregated knowledge. So this is the consensus of uh, fishing grounds. And uh, basically, it's uh, red means that most fishermen agreed with that area, and green means least. So you might think that uh, this kind of information, you know, we've got we've got uh, a retired fisherman trying to remember the fishing grounds that he um, he went out to fish on like some 60 years ago. So you know, it's kind of it's a slightly mental map, really. So for my fishermen, yeah, maybe the basis for, um, I guess, uh, the rigour of that, that kind of area as drawn on the map is, is, is kind of pretty shaky. If you've got, you know, some 10 fishermen agreeing on the same spot, then that, that kind, of, kind of consensus lends it, uh, lends it some kind of power. So... So this is from the 40s to the, the noughties. A decade by decade, um, you can see that uh, here we've got uh, one fisherman's uh, recollection of the 40s, because there's only one fisherman who actually fished in the 40s. Um, so we've got that. 50s, we've got uh, rather more fishermen uh, coming in, and you can see some kind of uh, consensus building up. 60s and the 70s are the kind of heyday, I guess, for these fishermen. And you see the clearly the the centre of density of where they fished, and the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. So what you see here would seem to be a kind of dwindling of fishing grounds and a kind of migration uh, eastwards towards this island uh, here, Ruapuki Island. But uh, it's, it's also bear in mind that the, kind of the fishermen who are kind of of this point of view are not those generally uh, who, are, who are currently fishing. These are re retired fishermen. Um, those who are currently fishing are I guess, I guess with the industry. So, I guess like, um, so, so there's there's very few kind of um, very few fishing grounds uh, in recent years that have been recorded. But that mean, that just means that we've got very few fishermen who are actually fishing in, in that decade. Okay, what can we do with this data? Um, we explored a couple of ways in which to perhaps um, kind of merge this local knowledge and scientific knowledge. And here we've got uh, 60s local knowledge representing the background by those, uh, by those polygons. And the points on top are uh, basic um, yield as defined by uh, the scientific uh, data collection. And visually, by and large, they they agree with each other. As we go through the from the 60s through to the 90s, so we've got the red dots, generally agreeing where the red polygons are in a vague kind of way. And we've got uh, it carrying on into the last decade too. I guess where the, the real, I guess, value of the local knowledge is uh, basically <coughs> identification and the 
a recording of these uh, informal fishing grounds, uh, given these local names, colourful names like uh, you know, uh, Shit Rock there, uh, a rock much favoured by birds. And uh, dominant ones like West Bed and South Side. So this is uh, a map that was defined by, you know, basically if the majority of fishermen said it was West Bed in this area, then it is West Bed. The amount of support for the identification of a particular fishing ground is represented in this map here. So basically the lighter uh, each polygon is, the more support there is for the identification of that polygon. So saddle bed, the support for saddle bed being here is greatest where it's lightest. So what I've shown are basically alternative representations on uh, a fishery. It's an alternative story. It's an informal mapping. And the message is that you know, it deserves to be uh, kind of up there and out there alongside the more scientifically led viewpoints and the management viewpoints. Yeah, for a kind of more holistic, uh, a truer uh, picture of history uh, of the of the uh, oyster fishery. So you know, this opens out uh, other ways. I guess we can combine both worlds: the scientific knowledge and the local knowledge as well. So using those uh, polygons, perhaps to to actually uh, depict scientific data. So using local knowledge, the identification of this at the west bed to depict yields as uh, collected by the scientists. So there we have it, two different views of the bluff oyster fishery and an, an illustration of informal mapping and how informal mapping could complement uh, conventional scientific I'm just going to uh, play a video, so I'm kind of uh, about halfway through. Before I move on to the other case study, um, this kind of, uh, I guess, juxtaposition of conventional mapping and narratives is kind of becoming kind of mainstream. This is actually a video from uh, the Ezra User uh, Conference, which is going on at this moment, and there's a um, it's basically uh, announced at the conference that there's a collaboration between Esri, who produced the market leader ArcGIS GIS software, and um, a journalist, a well-known journalist in America called James Fallows, um, who was basically going to spend the next few months just traveling around small town America and just blogging and linking that blog explicitly to a map by this uh, bespoke tool. So just an illustration is a free, uh, a brief uh, three-minute snippet of this video. Uh, which I actually have right here. There we go. So this is um, an illustration of Sioux Falls. This just, this just uh, exemplifies how the tool works. You can just see the juxtaposition of narrative and map. So let's play it there. I'm going to change the subject radically, radically this afternoon. The world's aerial imagery, which is in the cornfield a dozen last night. I'm going to give you a glimpse of what Washington, D.C. has just now put together meetings and, crucially, using <coughs> maps along the way. Let me give you a brief illustration of the new geoblogging tools that Esri's story map team in Washington, D.C. has just now put together. And by just now, I mean even last night. I'm going to give you a glimpse of what we'll be doing based on a trial run trip just 10 days ago my wife and I made to Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Most people here know of Sioux Falls, uh, so, Sioux Falls because of Eros, the treasure house of the world's aerial imagery, which is in a cornfield a dozen miles north of town. Sioux Falls is bigger than most of the cities will visit, but it has a surprisingly diverse and dramatic economic, commercial, technological, and sociological base, which we'll begin exploring in detail when our project goes live next month. I'm not going to in go into the substance of any of the posts I'm going to show you here, 
which have to do with the role of eros in the city's life why so many of america's credit card companies have ended up in sioux falls why so many of the midwest pigs are raised in iowa and then trucked to a slaughterhouse in sioux falls on their last day on earth why the ethnic makeup of the city has changed so dramatically and all the rest instead i'm going to show you the maps themselves you'll notice as i scroll through this uh, presentation the way that that some of the uh, that as we go from, from post to post, the maps automatically uh, scroll to, to match what we're seeing. These, this is a way, a new blogging tool that allows people to have posts and pictures on the one hand and accompanying maps they create on the other. There are ways we can do comparative uh, uh, analysis. For example, this is the part of Sioux Falls that has been, in, been a cultural preservation effort. What you see on yellow is a bike path around the city. The red is some other bike paths. And this illustrates the city's role as retailer to the region. The red areas are big box uh, retail areas and, and uh, where people come in from the countryside. Uh, this, for any of you who are bow fishermen, you'll be able to find a uh, river to fish in, in Sioux Falls. We're able to see things like the, uh, the to compare aerial and pict pictorial views, this is the slaughterhouse. It's how it looks on its day off on a Sunday. We're able to talk about uh, comparative social analysis. This was the ethnic makeup of downtown Sioux Falls before recent changes in immigration patterns and changes in the unionization of the, uh, of, of the packing house. Here is the way things look now, and you can return to comparative contrasts. Uh, we can, all of you have heard about the, uh, the shale, shale oil revolution that's made such a difference for North Dakota. We're able to explain with a map like this why uh, South Dakota has to look for different sorts of its economic uh, welfare because of the shale oil deposits reaching to, into the north and only in this small corner of South Dakota. And interesting geological contrasts. We learned from everyone we spoke with in South Dakota that really the way the state should be divided is East Dakota and West Dakota because the Missouri River is a geological and sociological and agricultural and every other sort of difference in the states. There are ways you can show this with, with maps. Those are crop lands, and here's the geological uh, difference, and also illustrate them with, with pictures. So you see this is looking south along the Missouri. You see the rough prairie on, on the right of the west and the flat land, the mi Midwest, on, 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 the, <coughs> sorry, on the right and the Midwest on the left. There is a lot more I could show you, but that, was, that is what our project is going to be about in the months ahead. And I think that the most important thing to remind you here is that while you've seen some of the things As you've seen that, I hope you're thinking of ways in which you can apply you know, such a tool in this general approach to you know, your own areas. So, you know, you've got maps, you know, why not kind of you know, associate maps with this kind of block, illustrated block. Um, it's an approach that could be done with the, map, the last maps I've just shown you. Um, so an illustrated history of the fishery alongside uh, the maps. So moving on from uh, narratives to another uh, channel of communication. This is art. So art and maps uh, are kind of not uh, not newly put together. I mean, uh, yeah, before you know, about 300, 400 years ago, art was quite regularly a part of maps. It was actually, you know, an ideal way of uh, depicting uh, the, I guess, the new world being discovered to, um, to in particular, I guess, uh, Euro European uh, nations. Here's a 1600s map of uh, the area that is, we now know as Antarctica. So um, not much was known about this area, and uh, you can see here that uh, this is Australia, isn't it? Yeah, so not uh, all of Australia was known at this point either. So um, basically, the the gaps in knowledge uh, was given the kind of helping hand through art. So around the site here, you see presumably interpretations of what uh, the Antarctic uh, locals may look like, and perhaps an indication of the climate. Um, where the mark, I guess. Anyway, maps and art have long been kind of uh, bedfellows, I guess. Uh, and then came this kind of uh, rush towards scientific maps, and art got forgotten, kind of. 
But within cartography in about the last 10 years, uh, art has been kind of reconsidered uh, pretty much in the way that I've uh, talked about before, as an alternative channel to depict an aspect of geography that uh, scientific maps can't adequately uh, um, convey. So art's ability, in particular visual art's ability to convey um, or instill or uh, engender emotion in human beings. Um, the, art could, uh, the, the map could do that, but, uh, but art is uh, it's got, it's got some kind of power that the map hasn't. Uh, researchers in cartography have um, had a look at just how maps, in particular visual art, could uh, coexist. Uh, one way is to have an artwork interacting with maps via some kind of computer interface. And the actual ex example I'm going to show is an example of that. Um, another one is the artist creates something in relation to the map or some geographic area. And the third way, and this is uh, from a paper by uh, Sebastian Cocard and uh, Fraser Taylor, um, integrating artistic methods with maps. So, you know, we see this already with uh, mainly tourist maps where, you know, you've got this kind of uh, artistic type rendering of geographic features, um, sort of artificial brush strokes and stuff like that. But can it, you know, be taken further? Here's another thing that we see from time to time, is actual, actual maps as works of art. You might have seen uh, the London Underground being reappropriated uh, for this artwork here by um, Simon Patterson called the Great Bear. Basically, Patterson has replaced the native stations with uh, native people, and each line is actually um, uh, representative of a particular group of people and what they're famous for. So um, the yellow circle line is now philosophers, so you can uh, follow those around and explore the map. Indeed, these uh, spheres of, uh, I guess, people in, in a different way. And you might... Uh, Actually, uh, can't read this. Anyway, yeah. So around the circle line here, we've got philosophers, and we got at the junctions, you know, where lines cross. So sort of juxtapositions, like here, for instance, uh, we've got uh, Captain Cook. So I'll just stop the philosopher line there. Anyway, it's um, it's a work of art. It's you know, it's been exhibited. Uh, more recently, uh, you probably all about the Apple Maps uh, debacle, uh, you know, kind of places being in the wrong place and so on. Um, well, these are Apple Maps that attempts to render the world in 3D. So these are actually, you know, automatically generated 3D maps. And someone has just basically, basically uh, scanned Apple Maps, looked for examples, put a nice name onto it, and their works of art. So maps as art. Uh, so we've got an inception style um, kind of rendering of the road going directly upwards. So uh, whatever technique is used to do this uh, can't handle, handle overhangs of buildings. And here's, here's a road being split lengthways uh, by this massive wall. So artifacts like that, um, you know, while this building here has been quite uh, constantly uh, done in 3D, uh, something happens here that means that this road is, is basically not so well done. Anyway, the kind of uh, visual appearance of this it makes it look interesting from an artistic point of view. Anyway, that's, that's a bit of an aside. Um, as I said, where, where I want to go is uh, how we use perhaps GIS to bring in more artistic and you know, from the previous case study narrative aspects. Uh, this is uh, someone's explicit attempt to bring in photography. Not aerial photography, but the photography much like we would take to um, you know, on holiday. And quite simply, in GIS terms, you've, you've basically reserved a layer for photographs, uh, what this guy uh, Jung calls the imagined grid. See underneath here the more formal uh, map data and simply on top, we've got photographs around this city. So it's a way of uh, merging quantitative and 
compulsive data. Okay, just moving on to this uh, second case study. So it's a, it's a collaboration with um, a local artist in Dunedin, uh, Diana Marinescu, and it was, it was aiming to be, uh, I guess, two different views on the history of the Kia uh, in New Zealand. So this is the Alpine parrot endemic to the South Island. Um, and so we've seen uh, narrative and form mapping in, in the case of the bluff oyster fishery. This is art. <coughs> So art is a complement to conventional maps. So the Kia, this parrot, uh, normally found in what, alpine areas. So basic limit is uh, above 100 meters um, above sea level. And its habitat is in the beach forests that uh, abound uh, the southern Alps. So picking up the timeline uh, about 15 million years ago, um, so the Kia was then uh, something called the Protocarca. So there's another bird called the Carca. And at some time, um, yeah, more recently than 15 million years ago, they basically diverged into different species. One is the Carca, which is found throughout New Zealand. And one is the Kia, which is only found in the South Island. The Kia itself, uh, was, uh, I guess, in danger of extinction up until recently. Um, in the early 20th century, it was led to uh, a spate of, um, I guess, sheep, sheep deaths. And uh, so pe people you know, kind of tried to kind of eradicate them. Uh, but now, yeah, after it was recognised that they were close to extinction, they, they uh, are now protected. So, this is the work of art. This is um, basically a, a painting with a timeline. This this, represent, this side here represents about 15 million years ago, and you can form the painting across in a informal uh, time strip from here through to the uh, present day. Um, over here, we don't see any uh, kias. But we do see some of the other birds that were around at the time. Uh, this is the massive uh, harsh eagle, which is the uh, predominant predator of the day, uh, hunting down a couple of moa, which are now, of course, extinct. And the key role in this is that the kia used to uh, feast on the, the remains. So after the harsh eagle had, had its share, uh, the kia would feast on the, the, the moa's carcasses, that, so just scavenge the remains. And then the timeline goes on through the last ice age, uh, and this marks the coming of man, I guess, the 20th century, and the introduced predators as well. And we've got man uh, represented by this hunter here, and the ships, the canoes, and we go on into the future. So this is a painting, and you can see the painting is, you know, a kind of very... Um, not so seamless way of merging different times into one representation. There's also many different places and spaces represented in this painting too. And so it's a kind of looser geographic representation. And I guess the message is that, uh, that there, there is a, some kind of uh, space, uh, you know, a metaphorical space for such looser representations to complement those scientific maps. Uh, for the maps themselves, uh, a few sources, um, a geological textbook, uh, which uh, it indicated the um, both the modelled coastlines of New Zealand back in uh, 15 million years ago and also uh, 2 million years ago, uh, around Pleistocene glaciation. Uh, here we've got this protocarca, which was to evolve into the kia and uh, carca species occupying this uh, unified New Zealand. I don't know how much uh, kind of strength you can put to uh, such representation, but um, this is this is my my adopted representation of New Zealand 15 million years ago. And then we've moved on to 2 million years 
uh, before present and the time of the last glaciation. By this time, we've got the North and South Island, but not as we know it. The split is somewhere through Palmerston North, which is probably 100k north of Wellington. But by this time, the Kia uh, yeah, speciated in, in the South Island area, <coughs> and this carries on. And for the 20th century, we are relying on sighting data of Kia and a kernel density operation applied to that, so it gives some indication of the area where they're found. This one is a book from a book in 1908, and you see them sightings all across the South Island here. And this one's from a doc report in the early 90s. So these were all kind of inputs into, into maps. These maps are famous. So the Miocene, the Pleistocene, with black indicating Kia, uh, the extent of Kia habitat, early 20th century, late 20th century. There's some kind of uh, indication of uh, future areas. Um, and for this, we've used uh, current day uh, data, an enclosed um, 100 meter contour to indicate uh, the, the basic uh, lower limits of height where the key has been seen. So anywhere above that is fair game for seeing Kia in the future. That's, that's the story anyway. And the black is the actual uh, the beach forest, which is favoured by the Kia in terms of habitat. So I'll switch across now and show you um, this uh, simple interface of how, I guess, you've got the work of art forming interface into a set of maps. So initially, you see the work of art, much like you might see it in an art gallery. And the, the um, mode of interaction is basically mouse over behavior. So you just hover the mouse, the cursor, over bits of the uh, painting and then it appears. So around the time of the Miocene, it borrows this implicit timeline in the painting. We've got the Miocene map appearing. Let's move across into the, the Pleistocene era and into the coming of man, the, the early settlers, and the more sp specific data we have about here is represented here in the early uh, 20th century here and the late 20th century here. And then uh, Going to the extreme uh, right of the painting, we've got that representation of the future um, actually intentionally kind of cut off. So it's, uh, there's a bit of uh, I guess artistic license for that one. Um, some of these ideas and ideas in the painting actually borrow from uh, instances of fine art. So uh, some, some of the uh, more prominent examples of art in the last um, uh, 500 years or so. So, for instance, um, incidentally, uh, by clicking on there, I've, 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 I've actually gone out of the intended mode of use of the, the interface. And uh, the paintings I'm going to show are just, just kind of cookies I've, I've hidden in there, just for illustration. This is a painting of um, uh, by the German Romantic painter um, in the early uh, eight, uh, no, early 19th century. Cast by David Friedrich. The users see as a metaphor for time. Uh, we have some figures depicted on the, on the shore here. Uh, Friedrich himself and some of his younger, some of his younger uh, members of his family. And each uh, one has a ship. And uh, I guess the ships themselves are a metaphor for life. Uh, Caspar David Friedrich's own ship is about to go over the horizon, so he's coming close to the end of his own life there. Let's leave that there. And you can see his uh, his grandchildren on the shore here. Uh, 
and their own ships are just kind of left. So the sea is a metaphor for time, and uh, so we've got the sea as part of the painting as a metaphor for the future as well. Um, the theme of many times in the same representation is something uh, that's not new to, to this. This is uh, an example from the Renaissance painter Raphael. And uh, we've got uh, two frames, I guess, in the liberation of St. Peter from a Roman jail. An angel waking up St. Peter in the centre there. And to the right of the painting, we have uh, the angel and St. Peter out of the cell. So we've got uh, two different times at once. There's a kind of implicit timeline. A kind of, kind of, kind of comic about the, the kind of dividing cutters. And the idea for the, uh, the map off the page There is. This is two little Trex uh, jockey, and to convey kind of motion into the page or into the map frame, you've got the horse partially cut off. And so it was with that map on the right hand side, the future map is partially cut off to convey movement into the future. So here we've got a different view on geographic representation. We've, we've got those maps in there, but we've also got some uh, artistic principles that uh, fine artists have developed over the years, being used to convey geographic concepts. And so this is a different um, geography being depicted. And so there's another example here the kind of comic books prevalent uh, over the last 100 years or so. Here we've got a, a comic strip a frame where basically time elapses from over here from when the photo is taken and the various actions and reactions to the photo uh, go from here right through to this end here. So we've seen a, a work of art as a, a powerful way to integrate many places, spaces, times, and also themes as well. Um, and there's you know, lots of directions we can take this in. So you know, uh, more kind of dedicated mining of fine arts and seeing how, how they depict in geography and seeing how we can appropriate those uh, in map making. Or as we've seen here, uh, the maps somehow interacting with the work of art. One of the overall considerations, though, is that uh, if you are to design maps in relation to the work of art, how much should one be compromised to accommodate the other? Okay. So work of art should be should work in itself and shouldn't actually have to kind of, you know, have, uh, have the maps considerations in its design. So there's a kind of uh, hanging question there. Okay, so just uh, summarising uh, this, I've, I've uh, depicted two different alternative viewpoints on mapping. Uh, one involves informal mapping, a kind of narrative of um, mostly retired voice officials and bluff voice fishery. fishery. Uh, one is, uh, the other one has to do with um, an artistic representation of the history of Ikea. A work of art that is in itself spatial and, and temporal. And uh, the interaction with the maps behind the painting via this uh, computer interface. So two, two different views on that history. And so you can see these kinds of representations perhaps have more impact, particularly in the public arena. And perhaps these can be used by the public in, in actually making their voices heard in, in the more official arenas. So we've got uh, envisaged use at this uh, community grassroots level that uh, the Bluff Voice of Fishery example was uh, held, held at. 
Above all, we are looking to introduce this kind of more human-oriented way of depicting geography uh, through the use of maps and also arts or blogs, narratives, and so on. So that's all I have to say. I just managed to say, um, you yeah, know, thanks, thanks to you all for, for listening, and uh, uh, thank, thanks also, you know, for hosting me over these uh, last couple of weeks, uh, especially to Amy and Nathan. Uh, looking after me these last uh, couple of weeks, and uh, yeah, and um, uh, thanks here also to the uh, contributory people in those two projects. Um, so, cheers. Yeah.